Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. This is a no hype mission focused channel trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. Today we're talking about grab stock, which is going public via the alt altimeter SPAC or AGC stock. Currently the deal, if the deal goes through later July, 2021, that's when it's expected to close. It would then trade under the ticker or the symbol GRAB. So grab symbol currently AGC uh, as it's the altimeter SPAC. Now I actually like grab. They're an exceptional company dominating their markets in Southeast Asia. They're growing at fantastic clips. They're creating a super app with self reinforcing dynamics, self reinforcing ecosystems that make it difficult for the competition. And I'll talk more about that later in this video. And I like situations, companies where it's hard for the competitors to try to compete because you start getting size, you start getting natural parts of your ecosystem where people just can't compete with you. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things that I like about Grab, the company, which, which is what it will be post merger or post, uh, you know, this post the SPAC deal. So the key foundation of their app started with mobility, think taking a taxi around a town, summing it on your mobile phone, then moved on to deliveries. And now they're looking at effectively a financial wallet or fintech or financial services. All three of these segments have huge tailwinds and significant hyper growth potential in the years ahead. So I like grab, but as regular viewers know, I also want to pay a reasonable price when I'm looking at a potential unrivaled investment. So is AGC SPAC or Grab a super stock? You know, they're creating this super app. Is it a super stock? And now AGC, which is how it's currently trading, is up about 50% from its original deal value struck at $10 a share. Now it's a little over 15. And the implied valuation for Grab is a little over $60 billion. So the $10 valuation was closer to 39 billion. Now that it's appreciated by 50%, it's closer to a $60 billion plus valuation. So in summary, summary, great company, lots of potential, but a pretty rich valuation. And we'll talk more about the valuation as usual. I'll provide a valuation sheet for you to play around with so you can think about the assumptions of what, what you think the risk reward could be. I'll discuss at the end of this video. Before jumping in, I want to call out Russell Paul and all my Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers. For more about that and my personal financial journey, you know, whereas I'm where I'm trying to find potential multibaggers, you need to go to unrivaledinvesting.com. But let's dive right into the Altimeter grab deal right now. So let me uh, set this up where boom. So here it is. You can see this is a big deal that they're doing with a four billion dollar pipe. So private placement in addition to the, the cash from the SPAC. So this is a big investment. I do like to see this, this sort of outsized pipe because it does reflect a lot of capital coming in that's not getting some sort of special treatment. That's not getting the sponsor share treatment. Now, that's the way it is with, with most SPACs is you, the, the SPAC sponsor gets sort of a sweetener or, or additional shares at a very low cost basis that results in averaging down their cost basis. So their, their, their incentives are sort of adversely structured such that they're incentivized to get a deal done almost regardless of valuation. Here it is, the fact that so much money is coming in at the $10 price suggests that management and the cohorts that they're working with, the investors that they're working with, are very confident about the deal. So huge deal, $4 billion, $40 billion valuation about, and expected to close in July of 2021, so just a few months from now. And Another key component that makes this deal, I would, I would argue, even better for prospective investors is a three-year lockup on the sponsor promote share. So that's that's not saying all shares, but the sponsor promote shares, the extra shares that they would have gotten, um, that they they can't sell those for three years. So they have to, you know, this is this is actually something I called out. I've done a, a separate video on like the, how the SEC has been putting out big warnings for for SPAC investors, and I, I'll, I'll leave a, a, a post to that below in the comments, but like putting this in sort of does align the, the investors in the SPAC sponsor a lot better saying, hey, whatever projections we're putting out for the next few years, we better deliver on them because we're this, at least this promote, 
we can't sell it until you know three years from now. So that's I do love seeing those those sort of incentives. That's that's way better than a lot of the other you know name brand specs that that I think most investors are, are familiar with. So what what is Grab when you're looking at? It? So they aim to be this super app with several distinct segments. So you have deliveries, which include sort of this express, and they're sort of saying alternative to traditional dining options, including home cooked food and dine in restaurants. So this is you know this is the way to think about it, like DoorDash for Southeast Asia, but also, you know, tr alternatives to traditional dining options, including home cooked food. So it, it makes it sound like smaller than a restaurant, like maybe some some person who has their own little kitchen that connects with them and then they're, they're sending their food out. So it's not like an official restaurant. Um, also Express, where they're talking about effectively enabling e-commerce by being the last mile delivery service. And this, this is something to understand when you're looking at Southeast Asia, you know, this is very different infrastructure than what you have in let's say a first world country or, or China, where you have some incredible logistics infrastructure that's set up where you can get like same day delivery here. It's a lot more tricky. So you, you need to work with the carrier, the couriers, the logistics. And so here it is, this is one of their functions, which is riding uh, effectively e-commerce, a package delivery for consumers. And also mobility. That was, that was you know, one one could think of, of ride hail options. You pull up your phone, you summon a taxi, or you know, they also have very hyper local market specific solutions. So each this app is sort of custom tailored per market. If you're in Indonesia, you're gonna have one solution. If you're in Thailand or Cambodia, you know, you might have a tuk tuk, which is you know this little three wheeled vehicle that's either you know electric or pulled by a person. Um, so the you know the the solutions are very different for what you have with mobility. Um, and then, the, so so you have delivery, mobilities, and financial services. That's the financial services. Let me shrink myself a little bit. You know, you could see it here on the right side, um, where you know includes effectively having a digital wallet. And keep in mind, these things all interact with each other. So, example, you're ordering food from a restaurant or you're ordering something online. Um, you know, having a digital wallet that works with it is critical. Um, you know, you're 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 you know, going from one place to another, you, you have the money stored on this app and then you start layering in additional features that really add a lot of value like insurance or investing or loans. That could be a game changer. Um, you know, sending funds to and from, uh, buy now, pay later options. So there's, they're definitely aiming. This is not just a one-off delivery app or a one-off food, you know, set, get, sending your groceries from, you know, getting your groceries in a timely way. They're aiming to become a super app. And so the big question is, will they be a super stock as I've alluded to already? Now, I do like this setup. I do like seeing the super app potential. Uh, and it's really interesting seeing how they are crushing it in Southeast Asia. I mean, let, let, let's look at some of these market share figures. 72% of total regional gross market value or uh, for, for the ride hailing business. So this is this is 70 effectively 72% of ride hailing done in Southeast Asia, they capture that that means they're the number one winner by far. And when you have 72% of a market, your economics are going to be way better than let's say if you were only 30%. If you're 30% market, then you're competing with a, a bunch of other players, it's tough for you to eke out a profit. We'll talk more about the, that sort of ecosystem dynamic in a, in a minute. Then the next aspect is their online food delivery, um, which you know, 50% of of the market that they're capturing. Once again, way better. You know, this is this is huge market share that they're getting. And the last bit of 23% digital wallet payments. That I'd argue that this is so early days in terms of where their financial wallet is that I I would almost ignore that just because you're going to have so much revolution in the tech fintech space in the years ahead but you know critically let's let's think of it as number one in mobility number one in delivery and number one they claim in financial services and critically they call out that not one of their countries represents more than 35 percent of revenue you know in in southeast asia so that is a little bit of you know quality diversification so it's less of a blow-up risk i'd argue you know 35 percent is still a lot but it's a lower blow-up risk then let's say if you were 80%, you know, um, all in effectively all in on one country, and let's say you have political change risk. So this is this is the key aspect that one investors typically like about platforms about, you know, what what you have in terms of market dynamics, where here it is, the bigger you are, and this is this is why part of the reason why they've gotten to such scale with ride hailing and with deliveries is because 
as you get more spending on the app and more people are using it, it attracts more merchants, let's say, to offer their wares on the restaurant to say, hey, oh yeah, we want to offer food because there are more customers offering. And same thing, same thing with deliveries. Oh, or, or mobility. Oh, there's more people looking to get from point A to point B. They're going to sign up with your app because the customer interest is there. And because there's more drivers, all of a sudden the cost can also go down because you have more competition angling to, to provide that service, in which case lo lower costs ultimately drives more consumers. So this is, this is what you're seeing with this chart, which is that more consumers, you get scale, it results in more merchant partners that sort of fulfill their value proposition. That Grab is orchestrating all of this, and as they connect more consumers, you get more merchant partners, more driver partners, and the whole ecosystem gets stronger. And inherently, it makes it way tougher for competitors to come in and try to, to unseat them. And so this is what, what some people call flywheel benefits. And you know, the, at, once it starts spinning, it, get, it gathers even more strength. That's, that's sort of the idea to think about it. And so I, you know, I generally love platform dynamics like this because with scale, you, you gain confidence as each year goes by that their future gets even better. You know, your, your confidence on what this business looks like five, 10 years down the road becomes even, you know, your, your confidence level increases as more time goes by and their ecosystem gets richer and richer. It gets harder and harder to unseat them. And you can see, like, not only are they building this rich ecosystem, this potential super app in Southeast Asia, but the markets that they're tapping into in Southeast Asia are barely penetrated, especially when you look at as a comparison to China or the United States. For example, with online food delivery, you know, you're at 11% versus over 20% in China and the United States. So that is going to be a natural tailwind for growth one would expect as these countries grow over time. Then another example is on on demand mobility, you know, dealing with basic infrastructure challenges where look look a lot of people in Southeast Asia can't afford a car and so it's hey, we have to rely on public transportation which might be spotty, the infrastructure itself might not be adequate, so you plug in that gap with mobility solutions like what you have and on once again on a hyper localized basis you know different solutions per different country and you know you could see three percent here versus china at 15 percent this could easily be a tailwind in the years ahead uh it, it did take a hit in 2020 as one would expect with with covid but before that it was growing at a hyper pace and management certainly does expect this business to reaccelerate in the years ahead and then this is where the real honeypot one could argue is with their digital financial services where only 60% of Southeast Asia population is, is effectively a banked population versus something like 90% plus for China and the United States. So that is a huge gap of underbanked folks where being able to have a super app that can provide even micro loans would be a huge difference for a lot of folks. And, and you know, the other aspect is they say 17% of 2020 electronic transaction volume. So that that is way lower in terms of electronic transactions versus what you see in China, in the United States. So that this could be a revolution in terms of how much upside there could be with capturing a digital wallet that goes with this sort of super app and, and layering on additional functionality. You know, hey, once you have a super app and you have someone's digital wallet in there, hey, it's easier to start attracting other venues. So not only are you ordering your groceries and going to a restaurant, but maybe you can start layering in additional things like entertainment and going to the movies. And those are initiative or travel. And those are initiatives that they are slowly layering in to the Grab Super app. So it's it's it, it's built off of the foundation of mobility, then delivery, then financial services, and then you're going to be able to add these incremental benefits. I personally, when I think about that in the valuation, I primarily just focus on the financial services upside. And you, you'll, you'll see the detail of the financial model in, in just a second, or the, the hypothetical valuation framework. And so looking at you know what, what they're penciling out here in terms of 
you know, the potential for their financial services, you know, this is just huge. It's not just payments, you know, remitting money from one person to another, but you can have loyalty benefits, um, some sort of discounts for using it. You can start doing like cash loans, insurance. This is when when you have such a huge gap in what percentage of the of, of what percentage of the population is underbanked and not able to get the services they need. Being able to get insurance or wealth products, you know, hey, once once you start setting aside some funds, oh, now you can start putting it into money market funds or index funds. I mean, this is a game changer for people with incredible value proposition for the end consumer. And then you start, you understand, you you ultimately, and this is this is the reason why I have I have high confidence that there will be a fintech revolution in the years ahead relative to current banking sectors. So this is, you know, no matter where you are in the world, I this is a high confidence perspective in my mind that you're going to have this fintech revolution because the data that these apps have, that they aggregate, is way better than the stale data that legacy banking institutions ask for saying, hey, what was your income last year? When you have apps like this that can see, hey, this is the amount of business you did as a restaurant you know, matching your, you're one of our merchant delivery partners that that's, you know, uh, that's a restaurant. We can tell how much business you did last week. So if they have real time data based on how much money is actually coming in each month and how much money is going out as you remit it to your employees, then you have a crystal clear perspective of what is an appropriate loan that you can make. So this is, this is a huge, that that's why I have high confidence in the digital wallet revolution. The question is, who's going to win and I'd argue these types of super apps definitely have a higher degree of potential in terms of capturing it. So I like seeing this. This isn't the only super app, um, you know, digital wallet that I'm playing on. I actually have, I think two others at least in my portfolio where I'm sort of banking on this, this digital wallet perspective because I think it's so probable that it happens in the years ahead. And so here it is, you can see the, the transaction or the total payment volume as it's growing. And you know, it's grown at 100% CAGR from $2.2 billion to $9 billion just over the last two years. And critically, you know, this, this, is the, this I'd argue is a huge advantage over anyone else that would want to compete is that they can leverage once again, the super app. And you can see what percentage of the payment volume is done on Grab, i.e. through the Grab services, whether or not it's mobility or delivery versus off Grab. So they start finding ways of doing more and more business without, you know, with where it's people just, let's say, sending money to and, to, to and from each other without actually having to be a mobility transaction. And so you, you start off with people using the digital wallet for your services, but then you start rolling it out, let's say, in other places. You want to go out to eat? Oh, you might see a, a grab little QR code and you could scan it. Boom, you, you, you use your wallet, your digital wallet right there. And that's an advantage. And that's it's amazing to see the amount of business that's off grab slowly but surely growing relative to their 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 piece of the pie so that you know started off primarily on grab or the on you know on the grab super app and they're it's growing more and more and they expect it to grow even more in terms of off the grab super app so people are just going to say hey this is my digital wallet do you accept this and that once again creates an even greater value proposition because it's like oh it, it it's like those credit card commercials like never leave home without it and you know it's accepted everywhere when you reach the saturation point, you're going to see these little, you know, pop ups in every grocery store or every restaurant or every store you want to do business. It's like, oh, just scan your card, scan your 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 grab, you know, QR code on on your digital wallet and boom, you can transact then and there. That becomes a huge advantage over time relative to potential new players looking to compete. So, you know, I already talked about the ecosystem dynamics with mobility as well as delivery. Here it is. There's also advantages with their fintech revolution or their financial services. And here, let me, let me shake myself a little bit. Um, so here it is. This is what their expectations are for the years ahead. 
you can see what the gross merchandise value or gross market value of you know what what they did and it's sort of flat year over year in 2019 2020 once again you had the delivery business go up significantly in response to covid people saying hey i'm i, I want more food ordered you know f order order it out i'm not looking to dine in and but it was offset by you know people not looking to be inside a cab because of covid concerns that said it is expected to pick back up in the years ahead and they are expecting a 40 percent kager in the years ahead in terms of the dollar value that's going across their platform which they think translates into 40 percent plus revenue generation they might be conservative here on these assumptions because i think they're assuming a steady take rate you can see that here of of you know the take rate is effectively how much revenue do they get based on the dollar volume that goes across their platform and you can see their effectively their revenue is effectively 13 cents for every dollar and they're effectively uh, assuming that stabilizes that number could go up over time as it has over the last few years and if that goes up then these growth projections would actually be conservative and that's a point that management do definitely does call out but this is not how I'd like to value the company I think if you want to be serious about thinking about a theoretical you know valuation framework what I do think is that you need to break it down onto into individual pieces and that's you know let's let's break it out by segment as we look at each of these components so right now once again around $15 share price is for AGC stock which will be grab stock in the future currently a little over 60 billion dollar implied market cap valuation but you need to think about what the hypothetical valuation will be for each of their segments over the next five years I take I try to take a long-term you know perspective as a prospective investor when i look at any investment i think shorter time frames you know you 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 you're sort of subject to the whims of speculators how someone's feeling any given day whereas over a multi-year perspective you have the fundamentals of the company carry you and so as i look at this valuation framework i see you know let's say mobility of, with a valuation range of let's say 20 to 60 billion i look at delivery that could be anywhere from 10 to 40 billion a lot of that just depends on what's their actual growth rate and then financial services that is the widest range in terms of what their potential could be i'm saying 1 billion to about 30 billion we'll go into each of these you know aspect in a second but this is honestly this is how i think you're supposed to consider looking at it is you can't just look at a consolidated revenue figure and say hey this is what the appropriate margins are because each of these will have different margins as we'll talk about in just one second. So let's break out, you know, each of these each of these different segments. And of course, as I usually, you know, as I always disclose, you know, the, this is a, a a hypothetical valuation framework. The stock price could obviously go way above, way below. But this is I like to work with a framework. You know, it gives me better confidence, helps me sleep at night when I have a logical framework framework that drives my investments. Uh, and this is part of my value proposition to you. The loyal YouTube subscribers, if you're not a subscriber, you know, if you haven't subscribed already, please hit that subscribe and, and thumbs up button, which is that, you know, I, I provide this sheet, you click, you click file download in the description of this video so you can play around with it yourself as you see fit, change around the assumptions as you'd like. You know, if, if you think I'm way off on the assumptions, change it as you see fit. Um, so, you know, as, as you look at delivery, you know, once again, this is the reason why we want to look at it on a different segment basis, which is that delivery, which posted fantastic growth. I don't have the exact to the dollar figure, so it's, it's sort of rounded based on the appendix of their presentation. So it had like 300% growth in 2020, obviously fantastic. Um, how 2021 plays out is a little bit less certain as folks are sort of saying, well, wait a second, you had this huge COVID bump. How much, you know, how much of a continued benefit do you get? Um, so, co you know, delivery is expected to be a fast growing business, you know, which could potentially get up to, you know, let's say 7 billion in potential revenue uh, over the next few years. But mobility, you know, you you look at it and, you know, once again, it declined in, in 2020. They're expecting a, a quick rebound next year, you know, ballpark figure of somewhere between 50 and 70%. Um, but the key difference is that their margin profile is so different. Going back to delivery, you know, management's targeting something like a 15%, you know, 15 to 20% profit margin or EBITDA margin. And so here it is, I put a range of 15 to 25% for their delivery, for their delivery margins. Uh, you know, you could see the growth rates that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about here of 35% to 50%, you know, over the, over the ensuing, you know, 
four years beyond that first year growth and then what's what's the assumed multiple of let's say I'm, I'm doing a range once again of 20 to 30 times you know you in your own analysis you could think about maybe making that higher or lower as you see fit but you know with delivery 15 to 25 percent profit margin growing fast Sure, mobility might be growing slower where I'm only penciling, let's say, 40% annualized growth versus 50% for delivery annualized growth, but the profit margins for mobility are just exceptional where it's currently, you know, they're effectively penciling out 50 to 60%. And so I use a range of 50 to 60% for their optimized margins as I'm looking at valuing this business over time and so as that you know given that super lucrative margins i actually do assign a higher multiple even though it's slightly lower growth just because you know they're they're already closer to profitability and you know management's effectively saying hey this is incredibly lucrative which honestly makes sense given a couple of different components i'll talk about right now which is one they have this huge market share 70 percent plus market share means they've beaten out a lot of the competitors so it's easier for them to make a profit so for them to make 50 percent you know ebitda margin on this this is fantastic this is you know the the, the ride hailing businesses around the world definitely look up to this sort of figure and not surprisingly they actually uh, effectively Uber sold out and to, gra to grab just because it was too hard for them to compete. And so when you have that sort of setup, I'm like, oh man, when I see something like that, then I know you you have a ruthless competitor because if, if you're if you're beating out some of these these balance sheets, you know, these major mega companies that have billion dollar balance sheets that are effectively saying, hey, we're gonna sell our segment to you because you're doing a better job. You know, that, that means you've beaten out competition. That is a big thumbs up. Um, and not surprisingly, that's it's being rewarded with probably higher margins longer, longer term. And that's the reason why, you know, I get this valuation range of 20 billion effectively to nearly 60 billion for mobility. And the delivery is somewhere between 10 billion and 40 billion, largely depending on what's the actual growth rate in the years ahead, what's the long-term margins for this business you know a difference between 15 and 25 percent you know margins for delivery is a big impact and then financial services you know this is definitely hyper growth potential but it's tiny it's teeny tiny you know 30 million in revenue in 2020 this is teeny tiny relative to their 60 billion dollar total you know this this is a 60 billion dollar company right now so you know what you're you're effectively looking at is potential hyper growth with this business and so on the upside i'm saying hey this could potentially be several billion dollars and revenue in the years ahead but look they need to prove prove out that they're able to successfully execute on this and given that this is a hyper growth financial products there's always the risk that you sort of blow off some fingers while you're doing it just because you know if you're making loans hey you know maybe maybe you, you aren't doing it as intelligently as you'd expect so they need to not only execute on the growth but i'd argue prove out their margin profile over time so when you look at these three different components which is mobility delivery and financial services then you aggregate it all you get a total valuation range of let's say 30 billion to 130 billion dollars for, for for grab and so you look at this and so you say well currently the market cap 60 billion dollars so that honestly isn't that compelling of a valuation range you know it's it's as i already mentioned this is a this strikes me as a super app super compelling company but the concern is that the valuation is already pretty rich. It's too rich for me right now, where I'm effectively saying 100% eh, upside, break even in my base case, and down 50% on my low side. So I'm, I'm not really that enthused by this type of setup, especially when you know Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers know that you know each month I try to call out a potential multi-bagger, and you know as later this week I'm planning on calling out my April 2021 potential multi-bagger, and that's a, that's a, an example where you know I'm looking at a company that I think has you know, closer to 200% upside and a lot less downside risk than what I think you have here. And it's largely just due to the difference in valuation um, that, that you have. And, and you, know, we, us, you know, a company with, with attractive, you know, uh, ecosystem dynamics like what you have here with Grab. But, you know, a lot just depends on making sure you pay the right price. And, you know, another example is my March 2021 potential multi-bagger. Similar, you know, where I'm like, hey, 200% upside and, you know, maybe 20% downside or 30% downside. Of course, you know, stock prices can go way lower than what you expect. But 
you know, I, I like once again, I sleep better when I have that valuation framework. And, you know, as as I'm as I'm, you know, talking about this is all part of, you know, if you're interested in seeing these potential multibaggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. And, you know, this is this is not hyper trading activity. I'm sharing my personal financial journey with those that are interested each month, one potential multibagger one one update on my full portfolio any material changes i also give updates on building a community with exclusive content for those that are interested if you haven't already subscribed to this this youtube channel where i talk about you know trying to find potential multi-baggers types of stocks and go up hundreds of thousands of percent make sure you subscribe if you're already a subscriber i do appreciate that